Um, and at this time, I'd like to reintroduce Dr. Michael Thomas, who is the chief of REI at the University of Cincinnati, who's going to speak to us on hyperprolactinemia. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things I always like to talk about, too, is uh, hyperprolactinemia, because hyperprolactinemia uh, does affect uh, not only fertility, but uh, affects uh, our patients in a number of uh, different ways. Uh, prolactin is a 199 amino acid uh, polypeptide. Uh, it's very similar to growth hormone and to uh, human placentolactogen. Uh, it has this sort of folded configuration uh, with its uh, three uh, disulfide bonds that uh, cause this sort of folding process to take place. Uh, and uh, it is uh, sort of uh, non glycosylated. Uh, 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 the the non glycosylated form is uh, sort of secreted, uh, is secreted by the pituitary gland. So it comes from the anterior pituitary, uh, along with the other hormones in the anterior pituitary, ACTH, uh, 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 LH, uh, uh, FSH, TSH, uh, uh, and then uh, growth hormone. Uh, and uh, it uh, is, affects lactation uh, primarily. It stimulates its uh, mammary glands to produce milk uh, which is its uh, primary uh, goal. Uh, progesterone prevents uh, milk production uh, during pregnancy, and then that falls, and that's when uh, you start to get the milk production. It does increase during orgasm, believe it or not. Uh, I talked to the, the guys, a lot of these people out of San Diego were doing these experiments uh, where they would give a woman a, a, a device and put her in a room and they had, uh, they were drawing blood every 15 minutes through a little hole in the wall, and uh, they noted that during uh, orgasm, uh, it, it's uh, thought to increase and it's thought to potentially uh, uh, cause the refractory period uh, after uh, orgasm. Um, it is uh, sort of regulated via, via this sort of hypothalamic inhibitory control. Uh, there is uh, uh, per, uh, dopamine, which is uh, the most common uh, pituitary inhibitory factor. Uh, uh, there's also um, uh, uh, others uh, like GABA that also uh, act in this way. So via uh, this inhibitory effect, uh, uh, prolactin uh, is uh, sort of controlled. Uh, there are also the uh, releasing factors. Uh, which include uh, thyroid releasing hormones. So if you, in a patient who has hypothyroidism, uh, they will actually also have, if they have primary hypothyroidism, they will also have uh, a TRH uh, to increase, uh, and TRH also stimulates the galactotropes. And the, these patients can also have a secondary hyperprolactinemia in some cases. Uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide also acts to release uh, prolactin, uh, angiotensin II, uh, serotonin, uh, vasopressin, and oxytocin also play a role uh, potentially in, uh, in, in releasing uh, prolactin. So there is prolactin uh, in the decidua. Uh, it does not really get secreted into the bloodstream. It's sort of concentrated into the amniotic fluid, so that's why if you were to draw out fluid uh, in the amniotic fluid uh, for whatever reason, uh, you could see that uh, the prolactin in the uh, amniotic fluid is 10 to 100 times higher than that noted in the serum. Uh, uh, there's also uh, serum elevation uh, during pregnancy due to uh, uh, pituitary prolactin. Of course, there are the, the three forms, the monomer uh, form of prolactin, uh, which is the one that's primarily uh, 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 secreted by the pituitary gland. There are also a uh, dimer uh, the, and a polymer, uh, the big prolactin and the big, big prolactin. And uh, these last two, particularly the big, big prolactin, the polymer, is less bioactive. Uh, there's a real controversy as to whether or not the dimer uh, is really uh, bioactive. Uh, there's some studies that show that it's not. There's some studies that show that it is. Most of the studies that show that it is are in the rat, but there are some human studies that show uh, the possibility of the big prolactin being somewhat uh, uh, bioactive. Uh, but the big, big prolactin, the big polymer, is not. And the primary 
uh, prolactin that has most of the effect in the human is the monomer prolactin. There are some fetal effects. There is some proliferation of oligodendrites uh, cells uh, in the fetus, uh, which forms the myelin coating on the axons in the CNS. Obviously, um, there's also the, what we, we know to be uh, uh, prolactin uh, uh, causing uh, their surfactant synthesis in the lungs due to prolactin, uh, and uh, uh, it's also the prolactin is thought to uh, cause some uh, intolerance uh, between the mother and fetus. As far as breastfeeding, 98% uh, effect on contraception uh, during the uh, first six months. So in a patient who exclusively breastfeeds uh, and is amenorrheic and is uh, breastfeeding for six months or less since the birth of her child, uh, that in and of itself may cause a contraceptive effect. It's not 100%, but they have to sort of satisfy these criteria. Exclusive breastfeeding, amenorrhea, while breastfeeding, and during the time of breastfeeding, and uh, during that first six months, uh, that the chances of that patient getting pregnant are pretty low. And there's a less than 5% chance of conceiving if uh, a patient continues to breastfeed on demand uh, for 12 months. So breastfeeding in and of itself can cause uh, a uh, contraceptive effect. Hyperprolactinemia in general is when, or when, is when uh, prolactin levels are greater than 25 nanograms per milliliter. And I say that, but the labs, depending on the reference that you have, depending on the assay that you use, I've seen prolactin levels as low as 20 and as high as 30. Uh, but anything over your lab reference is considered hyperprolactinemia. Uh, it really depends on where you are as to what you will generally find in that generally if you have a prolactin level, say, above 35, it's very rare to have a physiologic effect, meaning that most of these patients who have a prolactin 35 may not necessarily have any effect on their menstrual cycle. Uh, if a prolactin is less than 100, uh, uh, generally don't see effect. Actually, less than 200 is sort of the criteria for uh, the possibility of there being a, a, a microadenoma versus a macroadenoma. If it's less than 200, rare to see a macroadenoma. If it's over 200, generally it is associated with a uh, macroadenoma. Uh, and uh, 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 a lot of these effects and a lot of these numbers will also change. The etiolo etiologic factors associated with hyperprolactinemia will be dependent on whether or not it's physiologic, uh, pharmacologic, or pathologic. The physiologic causes include pregnancy. And in pregnancy, uh, prolactin levels can go up to as high as 200 to 400 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, lactation uh, can cause uh, uh, prolactin levels to be high as well. So uh, as you get away from pregnancy and even if a patient continues to <coughs> lactate occasionally, at some point prolactin levels will get into the normal range and then they will only spike uh, doing lactation only. Uh, nipple stimulation will also cause a peak in prolactin. Uh, exercise can increase uh, prolactin. It's been shown uh, that exercise can do that, sleep, stress, and we talked about orgasm. Uh, actually, prolactin levels also increase uh, if a patient uh, has been fasting and they get to around uh, the noon hour uh, after fasting. Uh, those patients can also see us spike in prolactin at around the um, uh, 12 o'clock around lunchtime. Uh, we were doing studies a number of years ago when I was a fellow on stress and reproduction. And we were giving patients corticotropin releasing hormone and uh, drawing blood every 15 minutes. We were trying to figure out if by giving, by activating, I think I talked a little bit about this yesterday, by activating the hyperline pituitary ovarian axis, if you gave them stress hormones, a from release hormone every 90 minutes and drew blood every 15 minutes from 8, p 8 a.m. to about 5 p.m. looking at LH pulses, uh, you could determine uh, uh, whether or not uh, activate, if activating the stress axis had an effect on LH pulsatility. But every day at about noon, they had this big spike in prolactin that did not affect their LH pulses. Uh, but prolactin does have this, these excursions uh, even throughout the day in a, in a person who sleeps at night and uh, wakes during the day. 
so there are these potential physiologic reasons that prolactin can increase pharmacologically estrogens can have an effect on prolactin they by decreasing dopamine release so by decreasing dopamine release prolactin can increase generally not to a point where you would have any type of issues but estrogen has been noted to increase prolactin one of the big ones are the neuroleptics the phenothiazines and some of the other medications that are used not only for depression but also for bipolar disease whether it's the Haldol or the Risperidol these types of medicines do have an effect on prolactin we'll talk about that sort of in a question form at the end and what do you do about it I will tell you in my experiences early on when we were sort of looking at prolactin as in patients who are on patients who became amenor who become amenorrheic on their bipolar medications what do you do for these patients and 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 some of these patients do have issues and you're always concerned about potential bone loss in these amenorrheic patients on bipolar medications these psychiatrists are very hesitant to give to have you give any of these medicines like bromocriptine or cabergoline so the question is what do you do for these patients if indeed they are they do not want to get pregnant antiemetics like Reglan or metoclopramide can also increase prolactin matter of fact Reglan is one of the drugs that sometimes used in women who are going to be wet nurses women who want to breastfeed a child whether they are related to their child or not or if a woman if someone adopts a young child and they want to breastfeed we've given these patients Reglan for a period of time with aggressive pumping and some of these patients can it can have a positive effect on them being able to produce breast milk protease inhibitors are all can also cause a hyperprolactinemic state as well as some other types of medications a lot of these effects noted with these medicines were resolved in about three months of once they take stop the medications so any type of galacteria form from the high prolactin levels that a lot of these effects were resolved on their own within three to six months some of the peripheral disorders associated with hyperprolactinemia include chest wall lesions so if a patient gets a herpes zoster infection chest surgery or even nipple piercing can be associated with hyperprolactinemia and and a lot of these conditions can be in the male or the female chronic renal failure can cause hyperprolactinemia a lot of the effects are then reversed once a kidney transplant is affected hypothyroidism as we talked about about 40% of patients will have a mild elevation in their prolactin because of the high TRH levels thyroid releasing hormones having a direct effect on the galactotropes ectopic secretion of prolactin can also occur particularly in like a small cell carcinoma or even some colorectal cancers can directly produce prolactin so pituitary and extra pituitary lesions can cause a hyperlyme pituitary disease state that can cause prolactin so if you sever the pituitary stalk there is generally associated with a partial or complete or complete decrease in dopamine which can increase prolactin so any type of traumatic stalk transection craniopharyngioma so a tumor compressing the stalk hamartoma vascular aneurysms any type of granulomatous disease that affect that could potentially affect that area including sarcoidosis or TB AV malformations or even any non-functional pituitary tumors can cause a hypothalamic pituitary disease state that could cause hyperprolactinemia so it's the most common prolactinomas are the most common form of a persistent 
uh, hyperprolactinemia. Uh, they are generally the most common functional pituitary tumor. Uh, adenomas are found in about 11% of normal patients uh, at autopsies. Uh, so if you do an autopsy on a patient, they look at the brain, 11% of these people will have uh, an adenoma, uh, which 44% of this 11% will stain for prolactin. 30 to 40% of growth hormone secreting tumors also uh, secrete uh, prolactin. Prolactinomas are, are very interesting. They're monoclonal uh, tumors. And as we said, uh, 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 the difference between a, a microadenoma and a macroadenoma if it's less than, if it's one uh, millimeter or 10 millimeters or less, it's considered a microadenoma. Anything greater than 10 millimeters is considered a macroadenoma. And microadenomas can compress the optic chiasm, uh, so they can have secondary uh, effects uh, just due to where they are and to the growth. Uh, they're generally benign, less than 2% uh, uh, of the time will they be malignant. Uh, in general, malignancies are picked up if uh, they uh, aren't affected by treatment, uh, uh, to be honest with you. That's when you start thinking about uh, malignancies. If simple medical treatment don't cause an, uh, a decrease in prolactin, if you continue to get a, an increase in prolactin after medical treatment, then you start thinking in terms of a potential malignancy. Uh, women are most commonly affected by uh, hyperprolactinemia, so our patient uh, base that we see uh, are more affected by prolactin issues than in men, but men can have these issues. And it's sometimes very hard to diagnose in men than in women. In, in women, it's easy. They, they tend to have some type of menstrual disruption, and you go through all your workup for secondary amenorrhea, which includes, of course, pregnancy as first, uh, and then um, uh, uh, TSH, prolactin, and depending on the age and depending on symptoms, possibly an FSH and an estradiol. Uh, so patients with prolactin issues, whether they have an adenoma or not, can have uh, uh, oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea. Uh, men tend to, first symptoms tend to be issues with libido. Uh, so uh, men who have uh, uh, prolactin problems can first complain of uh, having a libido problem. And believe it or not, I have a few men in my practice that we see generally pick it up from uh, husbands who come in uh, with their fertility issues uh, who have problems with uh, libido. Uh, and uh, their primary care doctor giving them all the uh, Cialis and the Viagras without success. Uh, but uh, prolactin uh, is a potentially a problem in some of these men, and it's one of the first uh, tests that we get. It can also cause impotence, uh, and it can also have an effect on their fertility because uh, if the prolactin levels are high, uh, you decrease uh, GnRH. GnRH in the men is not, it's going to affect their testosterone production, and they may have issues with sperm uh, counts and uh, sperm uh, uh, movement. Uh, so low libido, impotence, uh, and, for, and fertility problems uh, can be associated with the men. And as I said, in women, it's a little bit easier to pick up because uh, high prolactin levels are going to cause a menstrual disturbance. Also, uh, prolactinomas in children uh, can have an effect. Uh, in children and adolescents, uh, prolactinomas can cause growth arrests. It can cause pubertal delays, and in uh, girls, you will start to see a, a, a primary uh, amenorrhea uh, in these uh, girls who have prolactin issues. I know the first thing we sort of think of is uh, getting chromosomes and FSH levels, uh, but prolactin levels in this age range should also be considered. Some of the symptoms of, uh, of uh, high prolactin levels, whether it's for an adenoma or not, include galactorrhea, uh, so uh, milk production, generally a, a white uh, milky discharge versus a clear or red discharge. Uh, if you look under the microscope, you'll see uh, the fat globules. Uh, if you stain it, a Sudan rain, uh, red stain uh, will show these uh, flat globules a lot more. Uh, uh, it'll they'll sort of stand out. Uh, uh, as we said, uh, erectile dysfunctions can occur. Uh, decrease in libido in men or women can occur. Uh, menstrual disturbances, headaches. Uh, depending on uh, uh, what's being affected in the head, but sometimes headaches 
can occur uh, due to, a, particularly with my, macroadenomas. And if a macroadenoma is large enough, it can cause visual field changes and can be affected and associated with a, a bilateral hemianopsia, uh, which is when, of course, you can't see on uh, lateral side. You, you, you lose your lateral field of vision uh, with a bilateral hemianopsia. Uh, the milky discharge can occur both in the men and women who, uh, who have galactorrhea uh, with no history, of course, of pregnancy or breastfeeding in the women. Uh, incidence of hyperprolactinemia uh, uh, associated with galactorrhea, uh, 30 to 80 percent. So we always say about somewhere between 50 percent, but the numbers really range between 30 and 80 percent of patients who have hyperprolactinemia who will develop uh, galactorrhea. Uh, 92 percent of the time, you'll sometimes see this uh, hyperplactinemia and galactorrhea associated in uh, men and 10% in women. 50% uh, of women with galactorrhea will actually have a normal prolactin. Uh, so galactorrhea can also be associated in women with no other uh, necessary cause. And as we said, we see the flat globules under the microscope. Microadenomas, generally uh, easy to treat. The majority of them respond to medication. Macroadenomas are a sort of a different beast. I mean, they are big, uh, greater than one centimeter. Uh, they do cause a mass uh, effect, and they can be somewhat uh, destructive. Uh, not only do you have these effect on the uh, optic chiasm to cause the bilateral hemianopsia that we talked about, but uh, they can also disturb other pituitary function. Uh, they can also invade the adjacent cavernous sinuses, they can oppress, compress the cranial nerves, uh, particularly uh, three, four, uh, uh, six, uh, three, four, uh, five, uh, one, and five, two, and uh, six. Uh, and uh, uh, they can have uh, somewhat of a destructive effect, and these are the ones uh, that if they don't uh, uh, respond to treatment, uh, they need, these patients truly need to see a neurosurgeon for workup to make sure, one, they're not malignant, and to try to do what you can to make sure that uh, they do uh, sort of decrease in their growth. Pulse, uh, prolactin is a pulsatile uh, hormone. Uh, if, uh, if prolactin levels are below uh, 40, you could just repeat the test. Uh, but if elevated on repeat, you also want to check ATSH to make sure it's not a uh, secondary hypothyroidism uh, and a renal panel as well. And generally, you want to get primarily a galenium enhanced MRI uh, to rule out an adenoma uh, or a CT scan. Uh, just an a, a, a x ray of the brain isn't enough. Uh, MRI is always the first choice. And uh, uh, in uh, these patients uh, with the MRI, you will kind of see. Uh, a uh, lesions uh, in the brain uh, that are generally associated with uh, an adenoma, and you can see it's hard to tell because you don't see a before and after, uh, but there is this mass effect uh, that occurs uh, within the pituitary in and of itself. So as we said, uh, cutoffs generally microadenoma, if you have a prolactin less than 200, that's generally associated with a microadenoma, not 100% of the time. Macroadenomas are generally very high, higher level prolactins, over 200. Uh, in measuring prolactin, you can have this hook effect. That's one of the questions we always like to ask our fellows on examination. That was actually on this uh, year's exam. Uh, what is a hook effect? And a hook effect is when you can have very high prolactins but levels, but you aren't really picking it up with your assay. And uh, a prolactin over 1,000 may actually read as under 100. And uh, uh, these patients uh, in whom you truly feel the prolactin is higher, you, they, the, the levels need to be the, uh, uh, the assay. Uh, in order to do the assay, the hormone uh, needs to be, uh, blood needs to be diluted uh, so that you don't miss uh, this potential hook effect uh, where uh, you, the, all the receptors uh, in the assay are bound, and you don't really pick up the prolactin level as well. With microadenomas, you can observe them if you know it's a macroadenoma. 50% uh, of them will stay the same size. Only 7% will become macroadenomas. Uh, medical treatment is generally the most common reason for it, as well as these patients come in because they have irregular cycles. Uh, if 
uh, with a microadenoma if they do not want to get pregnant instead of uh, uh, place them on a medication. Uh, you can't just give them birth control pills and just watch their microadenoma. It's true that birth control pills, particularly estrogen-containing birth control pills, may make the microadenoma slightly larger, but generally they don't get to, depending on the size, they don't get to the macroadenoma stage. Uh, but these patients uh, do need the hormone, the estrogen, to stabilize their bone because they're at higher risk for uh, bone loss. Uh, these patients uh, um, uh, generally need some degree of uh, protection during pregnancy. They will grow and can grow. Uh, in patients who either want to get pregnant or uh, who aren't at risk for pregnancy, uh, medical treatment uh, is generally indicated uh, to uh, shrink their prolactin, uh, their microadenoma, and to cause a, uh, them to have normal cycles. Uh, macroadenomas, uh, generally medical treatment or surgical treatment are the options you want to uh, uh, give these patients. You generally don't give these patients estrogen-containing birth control pills because the macroadenomas can grow and can cause more of a mass effect. Uh, medical therapies include uh, the uh, D2 agonists. Uh, uh, the D2 receptors are, uh, uh, would generally produce the prolactin, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, which is the dopamine 2 receptors. Uh, the uh, prolact bromocryptine is the most common uh, uh, medication uh, and usually the first choice option uh, for patients who have prolactin issues. Uh, uh, um, the 80-90% response rate uh, in patients. Uh, visual uh, changes, if they have those, will improve within 14 days. 80% will see a reduction in tumor size. Uh, but like anything, there are some potential side effects uh, to this uh, med medical therapy. And those side effects include uh, GI side effects with uh, bromocryptine, uh, orthostatic hypotension, uh, nasal congestion issues, headaches, uh, some patients have even had psychotic symptoms. Uh, generally start out uh, with lower doses and then just increase uh, on a daily basis uh, as needed. The nice thing about bromocryptine, there are a lot of good studies to show that for patients who can't take it orally, uh, the absorption vaginally seems to be the same as oral absorption. Uh, obviously in the old days we used to use this for our patients uh, after they uh, became pregnant. Uh, uh, to decrease, if they didn't want to breastfeed, to decrease uh, 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 lactation or milk production. Uh, not used for that reason anymore, uh, and I'll primarily just used for uh, uh, patients who need it for this purpose. Uh, Cabergoline or Dostinex has a longer half-life. You don't have to use as much. Generally, twice, once or twice a week is all that you need. Uh, uh, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, even though uh, generic form is now available. Uh, less side effects than you see with uh, the uh, bromocryptine. You don't get the headaches as much and any of the other GI or uh, generally not associated with any type of psychiatric uh, effects. Most patients are, are treated with a dose of a half a tablet twice a week. So generally you're only using one tablet per week, but dividing the dose, a half a tablet, uh, generally uh, uh, Monday and uh, a Thursday or whatever your twice a week dosing would be uh, and that tends to have a positive effect in reducing the dose. Generally you want to recheck a prolactin level uh, with treatment of either drug after uh, about uh, four weeks of use. Uh, after three years of treatment with either Dostinex or uh, with uh, bromocryptine you see uh, a lot of these patients uh, go into remission, about a third of these patients go into to uh, some type of remission and they have a normalization of their prolactin. Generally a lot of these mic microadenomas would just sort of burn out on their own after three years. So just treatment for three years and then stopping and rechecking after about four weeks, a lot of times you'll see that their prolactin levels will remain normalized on their own. Uh, 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 Pertolide, uh, which is used for Parkinson's and quinolide also uh, can be used uh, 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 not available in the United States for this purpose uh, with similar efficacy as bromocryptine uh, in patients who have uh, these types of issues. Uh, surgery is generally never the first line of therapy uh, or uh, uh, for patients. 
if you talk to a uh, neurosurgeon, they will probably say something different. But neurosurgeons, if you send a microadenoma to a neurosurgeon, they'll operate on a microadenoma. They'll operate on a macroadenoma that they operate, and that's what they do. Uh, so you always want to try medical treatment as a first choice before sending them on. Uh, uh, surgery has it's thought to have a lower success rate uh, because of potential regrowth. Uh, 50 to 60 percent of uh, the time uh, surgery will uh, not be successful in microadenomas because they're very small and it's hard to get the microadenoma. Uh, and 25 uh, percent of patients will have a low success rate even with treatment with a macroadenoma. Some of the complications of surgery include loss of uh, vision. Uh, usually this is temporary if they uh, 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 they happen to uh, affect the optic chiasm. Uh, there can be some cranial nerve damage associated with uh, uh, the neurosurgical approach, which is generally transphenoidal. Uh, a lot of the patients will have uh, uh, CF, uh, cerebral uh, sp spinous fluid uh, 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 leakage. Uh, we used to get those patients uh, who were sent to us after uh, neurosurgery. Uh, we would treat them and treat a lot of their uh, uh, hormonal issues after uh, neurosurgery uh, uh, for uh, transphenoidal issues. Uh, meningitis can occur uh, due to infection and damage to some of the other pituitary cells can temporarily occur. Diabetes insipidus isn't that common. It's generally transient, uh, very rarely permanent in less than 1% or less of cases patients will develop uh, diabetes insipidus on an ongoing basis. Uh, morbidity uh, can occur. Uh, we sort of talk about uh, some of these other issues and 6 to 20 percent of the time with macroadenoma. Uh, mortality is also a potential complication uh, after a neurosurgical transphenoidal approach uh, with a macroadenoma. Radiotherapy is third line because you can uh, go in and have a uh, adverse effect on the other pituit the areas of the pituitary uh, other than just the adenoma that you are seeking to uh, focus on. Uh, better success with medical or surgical approaches than with or radiotherapy. And a patient becomes pregnant if they have a micro or macro or even an idiopathic hyperprolactinemia. Uh, stopping uh, medication is generally the first choice. So generally a patient will come to me uh, we'll have a hyperprolactinemia. We help put them on bromocryptine or cabergoline, but once they have a positive pregnancy test, we take them off. Uh, there is a risk of macroadenoma enlargement during pregnancy. Uh, they can be treated. Uh, uh, the uh, literature probably has a, a more uh, information on macroadenomas uh, or uh, microadenomas and macroadenomas being treated uh, with vermicryptine than with cabergoline, even though the literature, there's more and more literature on pregnancy treatment with cabergoline, but if, if uh, a macroadenoma is getting bigger during pregnancy, uh, which is what you're most concerned about, and that can occur in 26% of the time, uh, bromocryptine is usually the first choice treatment option. Uh, monthly visual changes and visual field testing is generally uh, recommended in patients with microadenomas who are pregnant just to make sure that they aren't having an effect on the optic chiasm. So uh, in sort of a couple of cases that I wanted to uh, go over uh, with you uh, and uh, to sort of throw it back to you, there were two particular cases that I wanted to sort of bring up and, and pass your way and, and, and sort of ask you what you would do in these sort of circumstances. Uh, the first is a 34-year-old uh, who presents in your practice uh, with a 12-month history of oligomenorrhea after stopping her birth control pills. Of course, everyone thinks the birth control pills caused their oligomenorrhea, and you have to reassure them the birth control pills did not. These patient, this patient wants to conceive, and uh, she has galactorrhea only on breast exam. Uh, you do a, uh, a urine preg test, and your urine uh, preg test is negative, and she also has a normal TSH. Her prolactin is 41, uh, and her estradiol is 19. What do you do next? What would be your next option uh, for this patient? I don't know where our little microphone are. 
needs it. Anyone want to? Would you repeat her prolactin? Yes. I would, the first thing I would do is repeat her prolactin. If her prolactin is now 50, uh, what are your options? I didn't, I didn't hear a response. Sounds like post bill, so I will just observe her and then repeat in about a few weeks the prolactin level. Well, generally in, in patients like this who want to conceive and if they have an oligomenorrhea, uh, generally uh, a um, workup uh, at that point would include uh, uh, whether or not, you know, your focus is whether or not this prolactin level really means anything. Uh, the things that sort of stand out is that her estradiol is a little low. Uh, so something's going on. If she's oligomenorrhea with a low estradiol, the question is, uh, is this prolactin contributory? So in these patients, we also tend to repeat, uh, get an FSH to see if indeed they are hypo, uh, or, or they have some degree of uh, hypothalamic hypogonadism. Uh, so if their uh, hormone levels are low, along with a low, uh, high prolactin, uh, um, uh, the question uh, really is, treatment, not only treatment, but whether or not they have a uh, microadenoma. Doubtful that they would have a macroadenoma. Uh, so in this patient, you have two options. One is to repeat uh, cases like this, and this is a patient of mine. Her FSH ended up, ended up being low. Her FSH was uh, 3.2, and her estradiol repeat was 18. So she was hypothalamic. Uh, which was thought to be due to her prolactin level. Uh, we did do a MRI because you can have MRIs, uh, uh, a low prolactin, even a 41, the chances of it being a microadenoma is low. This lady uh, ended up having a microadenoma uh, just so that you know what you were uh, dealing with, but whether or not you got the MRI or not is sort of plus or minus. Uh, but this patient ended up doing very well uh, and conceiving on our own with just uh, cabergoline treatment. Uh, so first step generally in a patient like this is to repeat it. Uh, and then uh, I would also repeat at the same time, get an FSH and repeat her estradiol because her estradiol is also a little off the mark. And if truly if she's showing signs of hypothalamic oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea, uh, then treating her with medications, a lot of these patients within uh, three to four months will start to have regular menstrual cycles, uh, and uh, this patient became pregnant very easily, uh, uh, was able to get pregnant, stopped her medication when she had a positive pregnancy test for gabergoline, and uh, uh, this patient ended up conceiving without any problems whatsoever. Uh, postpartum, uh, uh, she just stayed on birth control pills uh, and didn't have any uh, issues, birth control pills for uh, uh, bone protection and for cycling and she didn't have any issues otherwise. Second case, a 21-year-old uh, white female with a history of psychosis who's currently uh, uh, controlled with her medications. She's on a daily dose of one milligram of Respiradol uh, for her bipolar disease, had used Haldol in the past. Uh, she has galactorrhea with menstrual disturbances. She's had a negative uh, urine pregnancy test and a, uh, a normal TSH level. Her prolactin level is 98. It's a little bit higher, uh, not in the range that you would generally see a macroadenoma, but it is high uh, and an estradiol of less than 10. And her psychiatrist is concerned about her bone health. Uh, what would you do with this patient? In this patient, I would do the same sort of workup. Uh, I mean, the, the problem with patients like this, you want, you still have to make sure that they don't have uh, anything else. And just because she's on a medication that can potentially affect uh, uh, her prolactin, and we know that, doesn't mean she doesn't have a microadenoma or a macroadenoma. And again, uh, just because you're 200 uh, nanograms per milliliter at your cutoff, she could always have a macroadenoma. The biggest uh, uh, mistake that I see 
people make is not to at least get, especially a level this high, uh, get an MRI. And in a case like this, uh, this patient did not have a micro or macroadenoma. Uh, and uh, you're right, now the question is, what do you do for her? Uh, most people uh, aren't concerned, most people are concerned about their bone health, but they are also potentially uh, concerned about their contraceptive needs. Uh, so in a case like this, when you know you don't have a macroadenoma, uh, uh, birth control pills would be the, probably the best first step in a patient like this. So on somebody... Sorry. And I would say as you go get the microphone, that uh, there is a, uh, a rule of thought. The psychiatrists are very concerned sometimes about the use of uh, uh, the D2 uh, agonists like uh, uh, the bromocryptines and the cabergoline making their uh, issues with their psychosis worse, uh, but the, the literature doesn't necessarily show that. It doesn't necessarily support the fact that their uh, issues with their psychosis may actually worsen on these medications, but that's one of the first things that the psychiatrists are concerned about. Well, go ahead, I'm sorry. So, no, it's great. So in somebody like this who you've had a negative workup, you know this is likely her drug now, mm -hmm. how often do you need to look at that again? Generally, while they're on the medications, you know that the medications are causing the problems. You don't necessarily need to check it all the time. If they decide to go off of their birth control pills, uh, uh, it may be something that you want to follow just because of their bone health needs. Now the concern is what happens in these patients, and they do. Sometimes these patients want to get pregnant. Uh, what do you do? Uh, uh, generally, we try to work with the psychiatrist, and at that point, uh, in patients who we get medical clearance from and we generally send these patients also to our MFM uh, colleagues uh, so that they, uh, they get sign off on them. The, the biggest concern I have, and I see this with my wife's practice, you get, um, uh, we get these referrals for people who want to get pregnant and our goal is to get these people pregnant. Uh, we figure if they come in from their OBGYN or they come in from their nurse practitioner or midwife, that that is what they are coming to see us for is to get pregnant. Uh, we sometimes, if they come in, if a lady's 300 pounds, it's not really our job to counsel them about their weight. We assume that's happening downstream before we get there. We always encourage people to lose weight if they uh, want to get pregnant. But in cases like this, when clearly they are uh, on a medication that's keeping them stable, and if they have bipolar disease, and hopefully the medicine is, is we are consume, assuming is controlling that, you don't really want to take them off their medication. If they truly want to get pregnant and they get the appropriate clearances, we will put them on a uh, uh, medication like bromocryptine or uh, cabergoline, and that will cause them to have more regular uh, menstrual cycles and increase the chances that they can get pregnant. One of the concerns, uh, one of the questions that always comes up is how does prolactin, hyperprolactinemia, affect uh, menstrual cycle regularity? It's thought that it's, it, there's a direct effect of prolactin on GnRH, that GnRH pulsatility is affected by prolactin. So prolactin goes up to uh, uh, the hypothalamus uh, uh, and uh, generally affects uh, the GnRH pulsatility directly and that causes this downstream decrease in FSH and LH release, which then causes the menstrual irregularities. In these patients who are psychotic, uh, in the times we've treated, the few patients that have come through that have gotten an okay from their uh, psychiatrist, that they seem to have a stable life and, and they are ready to get pregnant, and you send them to their OBGYN or their MFM <coughs> and you get clearance, uh, uh, these patients tend to do very well. They're uh, need for uh, their antipsychotic medication doesn't necessarily increase. Uh, uh, they tend to do very well uh, during their pregnancies with the appropriate uh, 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 medications that they're on throughout their pregnancies, and they, they tend to do okay. Uh, but I'm sure there are cases where they do not. But uh, in a case like this, this is one of the cases that we see a lot in patients who are get referred to us for oligomenorrhea who are on these antipsychiatry. Uh, antipsychotic medications, and sometimes uh, the psychiatrists or the psychologists that's treating these patients don't realize that the medications are generally the cause. Thank you very much. <laughs>